Yes, please. If you say a state that uh, the uh, Nogeek laws are autonomous, then they must be a uh, fruit of Darwinian evolution. Okay, so, so in, in this regard, I think it's, it's very important for me to clarify, and I apologize if I didn't sufficiently clarify this before, what we mean by autonomous versus heteronymous. That is, when I speak of a moral system as being heteronymous, that means the only way you could access it is through an appeal to an external instruction. As a case in point, the system of the Torah, unequivocally, is heteronymous. There would be no way of our intuiting, intuiting it on our own. And indeed, on a practical plane, as I noted, the presumptive status of one in violation of Torah law in Israel is that unless that individual has been forewarned, he cannot be held culpable because he may not know. With respect to the Noahide laws, by describing them as autonomous, what we mean is it is possible to access them through the inner reflection of the individual. That is, on the contrary, we're not describing them as derivative of some set of instincts, some legacy that comes from a dim primate past, but on the contrary, as that which results from the unique self-contemplation in which only a human being can engage. And um, I must stress in this regard that while there has undoubtedly been on manifold planes a lot of erosion with respect to the sense of singularity pertaining to the human condition, in particular in the behavioral sciences over the course of the last century or so, this is a dividing line that I posit is unbridgeable and will remain so. Because the dividing line doesn't pertain to behavior. It doesn't pertain to what you do, but why you are doing it. That is, the capacity to engage in abstraction, in reflection, and by dint of that, to reach conclusions that pertain not merely to utilitarian benefit, which animals can certainly do, but rather to an ontology of right and wrong, of good and evil. While one could argue that we haven't taken um, the chimps into the lecture hall to interview them, and maybe they are engaging in contemplative processes that we have simply no way to recognize, it certainly is possible. I think it's unlikely. I don't think there's any indication of the capacity to abstract in all of the clever behavioral experiments that have indicated the extent to which chimps can master symbolic format and language skills and so on and so forth. We by no means are going to underestimate their capacity for cleverness. But we will, however, draw a definitive line of demarcation with respect to them becoming moral beings. And that, that ability to be a moral being, is what I'm identifying as autonomous morality. That is, uh, to be able to cultivate a sense of right and wrong that is predicated upon our inner world, our introspection, as opposed to merely based upon learning. And again, I'm going to reiterate that it is within the prism of this realization that we understand why the Noahide laws, and only the Noahide laws, let's put them on the screen again, are the, the basis of the foundation for humanity generally, as opposed to a system that is heteronymous, the system of the Torah, for which one necessarily must be party to something that is received from outside. The Torah is something that is based upon revelation. The Torah becomes binding <coughs> upon those who are party to a specific set of experiences. It obligates those who experience the Exodus and those who are then subservient to the experience of the Exodus by dint of their national affiliation. And of course, in no wise is it at all incidental here 
that the opening line of the Decalogue, quite on the contrary with respect to any of the above, is, I am God your Lord who brought you forth from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. And other specifically in the wake of the Exodus, does the Decalogue become binding and not based upon an appeal to any kind of autonomous system. It therefore obligates Israel, one can choose to vicariously engage in the obligatory experience by becoming part of Israel, but obviously that could never be required or even really encouraged because it is essentially engaging in something that is foreign to one's Weltanschauung as emerging from a different set of experiences and again, to that extent, the obligation of the corpus of the Torah is one that devolves exclusively upon Israel. I, I think it is particularly edifying in this regard to consider what I noted earlier as the obligation of forewarning in order to establish a threshold of culpability with respect to violation of the Torah for one obligated by the Torah, because in essence, accepting the Torah what Israel did at Mount Sinai is what I would describe a bit colorfully as uh, recognizing that their innate moral sense was bludgeoned into submission by the might of revela revelational experiences that were to them unimpeachable. Note that when that innate moral sense is thus bludgeoned into submission, then one becomes exclusively deferential to the heteronymous system of Torah, even with respect to actions that would otherwise be subsumed within the autonomous system of the Noachide laws. And we need to establish a threshold of culpability by ensuring that you are aware of the content of that heteronymous system which you could not access on your own without being taught it, even as moral living based upon the heteronymous system of the Noachide laws is something that is presumed to be directly accessible by every human being. Now, this is a critical component, first of all, in appreciating what to me is uh, a, an essential component of my mission in engaging in an encounter like this one, in building bridges between Jews and Christians, because I must note in this regard, and I realize that I'm going to make a comment that might seem a little bit far afield, but I think it necessarily relates to what we just discussed. That when Jews and Christians come together, for the most part, and this has, I think, been the case since such encounters have picked up in earnest, say, since World War II and the Holocaust. They come into the room, and uh, the way I like to describe it is they uh, try tactfully to ignore the great big elephant in the room, which is their religious identity because it's awkward and it's unpleasant and we don't want to step on raw nerves or exposed toes. So we come into the room, but we really don't come into the room because I know that if I come into a room and leave my religious identity outside, and I know the same is true for my Christian brothers, that when they come into a room and leave their religious identity outside, then we're still outside. We haven't come into the room, because the essence of what we are hasn't come into the room. The problem, the challenge is, how can we come into a room together without, well, let's grant that we've graduated to a level of, at the very least, tact and civility that we won't be at one another's throats. <laughs> but will still be at one another's souls. That is, if I love you, shouldn't I want to convert you? 
And of course, inevitably, the answer pertains directly to what we just discussed, because if indeed the only view of life were there is my way and there is the wrong way, <laughs> then if I love you, I want to save you from the wrong way. And uh, truth be told, I think this is a very common and all too common phenomenon among religious people generally. We're not going to get more specific than that. That religious people <laughs> tend to view their way as the right way. The right way for everyone. Now let's consider what emerges from the bifurcation established by speaking of a system of autonomous morality that pertains independently of any system such as the heteronymous morality imposed by the Torah concomitantly with the existence of such a heteronymous system. That would mean that for those who meet the very specific criteria for imposition of the heteronymous system, the Torah is their right way. But it's not the right way, because this is also a right way. It depends, of course, for whom. There is a system that God gives Israel as the system through which Israel is to come to God. At this point, of course, I am, admittedly, unabashedly speaking, theistically. And that system, as we see throughout the Torah, I'll emphasize in particular in Deuteronomy chapter 30, there's a particularly apropos passage, beginning in verse 15. See that I have placed before you this day life and the good and death and evil that I command you this day to love God your Lord, to go in His ways, to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments. And then you live and multiply and God blesses you in the land that you are coming to inhabit. And in the continuation, I have called to testify before you, in verse 19, the heavens and the earth, life and death, I place before you the blessing and the curse, and you shall choose life. That is, please choose life that you will live and your children will live, to love God your Lord, to, uh, to heed His voice, to cleave to Him, and so on and so forth. Now this is a system that is explicitly described as the basis, the prerequisite of life. What life? Obviously not life in this world. No matter how faithful you are in loving God and keeping His directives in this world, we're pretty much guaranteed that we will die. This is the, co the course to everlasting life that God is prescribing. But prescribing to whom? To the recipients of the heteronymous system that he gave through the commandments of the Torah, to which there is, of course, in this passage and throughout the Torah, explicit reference. That's not the only path to everlasting life. Now, I need to preface to my next sentence an important caveat. I am speaking from my perspective, which should be, of course, self-evident because not a single word that I said today did I say from any perspective other than my own. But I do feel compelled to stress it here because I realize that you, as Christian believers, see your course to salvation in a different manner than what I'm going to present because I'm not presenting the reason that you believe you attain salvation. I'm presenting the reason that I believe you attain salvation. I believe you attain salvation, from my perspective as a Jew, because of your fidelity as Christian believers to this autonomous system of morality that is encompassed by the Noahide laws. And I will indeed reiterate in this regard that since I am very fond of the thesis presented by Rabbi Jacob Emden, uh, I also subscribe to what he posits, which is that he cites specific references to bolster the case with respect to the words of Jesus and Paul, and extends it to the apostles generally, that they had a dual agenda 
of reinforcing observance of the Torah and its commandments in Israel and establishing a system which isn't at its core a new religion. It is rather on the contrary. The dissemination of the oldest true religion to establish Christianity as the means for the dissemination of the Noahide laws throughout the world. And that just as the former is the system that God imposes upon Israel as the pathway to its salvation, the latter is the pathway that God provides to the nations of the world as the pathway to their salvation. And they're both paths that lead to salvation. And therefore, uh, getting back to the issue of the elephant, I don't have any inclination or any intention to dissuade you from your beliefs, not because I don't love you, but because I love you and respect you and believe that by your keeping the system of the Noahide laws, you attain personal salvation, you have a share in everlasting life, you contribute to the final redemption of the world, so why should I try to dissuade you from doing that? Now, of course, again, I want, to, I want to stress here. I'm not telling you why you believe you are saved. I'm telling you why I don't feel compelled to try to persuade you to change what you are doing in order to be saved. Because from my perspective as a Jew, you attain salvation through what you are doing. There's an additional caveat that I want to stress here. And this actually pertains, ironically, to a kind of... Um, potentially um, destabilizing of the very foundation that I just stated before with respect to the Noahide laws being a system of autonomous morality. And that is, uh, truth be told, this is something of a domain of dissension among various authorities in our tradition. Is it sufficient to keep this autonomous system of morality as an autonomous system of morality in order to attain personal salvation? Or is there the additional requirement to subscribe to it not merely as an autonomous system, but rather as a God-given system? Now, it's important for me to clarify this point because I realize what I just said right now may sound bewildering and even contradictory to what I said earlier. No one dissents with the realization that this is a potentially autonomous system. But it being an autonomous system, that is, a system that one can access by application of your mind, does not dictate that, in fact, you only do it as a consequence of your own mental activity. That is, even if it's an autonomous system, if you believe in God, you subscribe to the system not simply because your intellect dictated it, but because God dictated it. And the truth is that there are authorities in our tradition who maintain that it is simply the act of upholding this covenant that is all that is requisite in order to attain personal salvation, in order to attain a share in everlasting life, in order to contribute to the redemption of the world. And then there is an alternative view that for those consequences, to attain personal salvation, a share in everlasting life, contributing to the final redemption, one needs to uphold the covenant out of a conviction that this is what God commanded. If you ask me what conceptually underlies these two views, I think the answer lies in the underlying attitude with respect to society generally. Meaning, the Noahide laws manifestly are prerequisites of establishing an equitable ethical society. They are not, I should stress, merely a kind of um, biblical alternative to Kantian moral imperatives. They are not because Kantian moral imperatives are just that, moral. This is a system of spirituality. It is manifestly a system of spirituality, not mere morality. Well, if one posits that 
the establishment of an equitable society is in and of itself of intrinsic spiritual value, then one could posit that simply upholding the Noachide laws is, therefore, an intrinsic spiritual act. And then, since of course, manifestly, the prerequisite of everlasting life is spiritual vitality, because, after all, physical things decay. Why do physical things decay? Because of the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> Entropy tends to increase. Everything falls apart. You know, your car stalls, your computer crashes, your body disintegrates. That's all part of the second law of thermodynamics. But the second law of thermodynamics is a law of physics. It applies to physical things. To whatever extent a person is merely a physical being, he is subject to physical laws. To whatever extent you are not merely a physical being, to whatever extent you are spiritually vital, you transcend the limitations of physicality. So if, then, the establishment of such a society is a spiritual imperative, then, merely by upholding the Noachide laws, one becomes spiritually vital and connects with everlasting life. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that establishing an equitable society is all well and good, but, you know, in a way, um, chimpanzees do that as well. Merely having an equitable society is a vehicle. It is not an end. And if that is the case, then a system that establishes an equitable society becomes a spiritual one only through the explicit invocation of a spiritual authority, not merely the autonomous one, in upholding it. And therefore, when one subscribes to the system as a system that is given by God, that serves as the basis for the spiritual vitality that is the prerequisite of everlasting life of personal salvation, of contributing to the final redemption of the world. Besides the obvious relevance of this ob observation to the Noachide laws, there is, of course, an additional agenda that I have in stressing this point here. And, of course, this agenda, uh, additional agenda should be self-evident to all of us. And that is, from my perspective, you all, obviously, are keeping the prescriptions of the Noachide laws not merely for the betterment of society, but in your service of and obedience to God. And that unequivocally renders the upholding of the Noachide laws a spiritual act, a spiritual basis of everlasting life, of personal salvation, of contributing to the final redemption, which is why it serves as so critical a foundation upon which Jews and Christians can stand together. That is, at least from my side, I can deal with the elephant. Uh, and of course, inevitably, you probably already anticipate this is coming, my challenge to you is you as Christians need to figure out how you're going to deal with the elephant as well. That is, I fully appreciate that my Christian brothers who would have me and my fellow Jews adopt Christian beliefs nowadays, nowadays are motivated by genuine love. And uh, indeed there are, I realize, Christian believers who feel that any failure to attempt to evangelize Jews is tantamount to anti-Semitism. But of course, simultaneously, I think it's important for us to recognize that while the love can be genuine, it is a love that is perforce bereft of respect. It's treating Jews like a bunch of godless pagans who need to be introduced to God, which is a position that one can readily sustain until, but I submit only until, one opens up the Bible and sees that God sent Israel to introduce him to the world. But 
for our purposes is the crucial bottom line is love that is devoid of respect is not a basis of being able to stand together. In order to be able to stand together, again, the challenge is to be able to conceive of my way being my right way as God gave it to me, which doesn't exclude the possibility that his or her right way may be the way God gave him or her to come to him. Indeed, in our classic sources, um, in the works of two of the greatest giants of our tradition in the medieval period, Rabbi Judah Halevi, in his philosophical classic, Sefer HaKuzari, and Rabbi Moses Maimonides, at the end of his halachic code, both, and both probably independently of one another, because, you know, even though they were separated by a generation, they didn't have mass-produced printed texts in those days. Both of them speak of Christianity as a vehicle created by God in order to disseminate the core beliefs of the Torah, the core beliefs in God throughout the world. Because, you know, we read in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, I have given you as a light of the nations, that my salvation will be to the end of the earth. Okay, so God's goal is not saving an individual, or even a bunch of individuals. God's directive is that my salvation will be to the end of the earth. Well, you know, I have to admit, that's a problem for us, in practice, because we don't reach the end of the earth. Especially considering that God bids Israel to be in the land of Israel. And that's besides even recognizing that, goodness, going to the end of the earth, it's going to be awfully difficult to keep the laws of Kashrut and uh, to, you know, to observe the Sabbath and so on. Okay, the, 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 the mission of Israel is indeed to obey God's charge, to be <coughs> that light, to be in Zion, whence, as we know, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, Torah, teaching, comes forth from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. But in order to fulfill that mission of that my salvation will be to the end of the earth, we need to work together in order for that salvation to reach the end of the earth. But it only happens again when we have the realization that God, our loving Father, gives each of us a unique mission, a unique role to come to Him. The same goal. We are all coming to God. But if we're coming from different places, as we are, inevitably we will take different paths in order to reach that destination. And each way can be right, as long as it is the path that God has given to each of us in coming to Him. Which is why I think our understanding of the message of the Noahide Laws is so critical in appreciating that there are indeed multiple paths. God did not obligate the nations of the world to keep the path of the Torah and its commandments. That again is a heteronomous system and it is predicated upon the Exodus and the Revelation at Sinai and that bludgeoning into submission that I mentioned before. And he provided this autonomous system of the Noachide laws for the world. And that too is a pathway that leads to salvation, to redemption, to everlasting life. And I believe that if we can integrate this message, if we find the means to integrate this message, then not only will we be able to enter the room together and stand together on the platform of God's will revealed in His Word in the Bible, but we'll also be able to deal with the elephant. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, because uh, I do agree. Uh, uh, thank you God bless you. But <laughs> well, in this point with point one, no murder, as you say, Christians and Jews together, we have to say sorry, don't you think so, for all the murder we did in 
that's my, you know, it's, uh, it's a big, big news moment. I, I read in Deuteronomy, fathers shall not be put to death for the sons, and sons shall not be put to death for the fathers. Each man dies for his sin. I, I do respect and I, um, I stand really in, in admiration of your feeling of grappling with the path, with, with the past. But while I realize we can't just turn the page and forget that there were chapters that were already written, we still need to turn the page. And, and we can then stand together because um, although I don't know you personally, I, you look like the type of person who, who, is, who is not murdering. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <it's laughs> so we can still stand together, yeah, but definitely. Okay. But yeah. uh, uh, that is, each, each one lives or fails to live based upon our own fidelity to God's word. Yeah, as we read in particular in Ezekiel chapter 18 and chapter 33, the, uh, the son who abandons God is not going to be saved because of his righteous father. And the grandson who returns to God is not going to be damned because of his wicked father. Everyone has the wherewithal to forge that pathway to God. And ultimately, when we speak of an autonomous system, that's what it means. I don't need to ride on the coattails of anyone who came before me, nor am I encumbered by anyone who came before me preventing me from connecting with this system. Every man stands before God. Everyone. God bless you. The beard may go for okay. um, thank you very much. I find it very uh, inspiring, but it um, also gives me a lot of questions. Good. Um, and I think, um, uh, well, let's start with, uh, there are also major voices in the Jewish tradition who consider Christians to be uh, idolatrous. Mm. So they don't um, think that Christians, uh, you know, keep the Noahide laws. Um, Maybe I should uh, address that before we, you, we, you move on to additional questions because that really warrants yeah. its own treatment. It's also my question. Because of the alien service. Okay. So, saying Jesus is God would maybe fall. Okay, so uh, uh, with, with respect to this issue. Uh, you know, I, I, I think Abu Dazaga's alien service is the best translation to use here. And um, I completely uh, uh, assent with the statement that is, it is a domain of dissension in our authorities as to how to relate to Trinitarian belief. Uh, in particular, I'll note in this regard that uh, perhaps the most significant voice that does impugn Trinitarian belief as tantamount to a violation of Avodah Zarah mm -hmm. is the position of Rabbi Moses Maimonides. But, you know, simultaneously, I do feel compelled to stress here, um, while he does take this position, and he articulates it explicitly in his halachic code, his code of Jewish law, in order to understand what its basis is, I think we need to examine not only his legal writings, but also his philosophical writings. And um, he writes in his philosophical magnum opus, in Guide of the Perplexed, in Unit 3, in Chapter 51, that when a person engages in service of God without having attained knowledge of God, then he is essentially serving a figment of his imagination. Because there is no existent that corresponds to what he thinks is the object of his service. No, this now, is not very helpful for the elephant in the room. No, wait, 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 hold a second. <laughs> no, I, 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 want, I just want, want us to appreciate the, the full gamut of the implications of that statement. Okay. Um, I don't know how many people, including how many Jews, can survive that scathingly exacting gauge of service of God, which I think historically is indeed the reason that Maimonides' view on this subject was not accepted by the majority of authorities. That is, um, I think it's important for us to understand 
I, in terms of the framework of internal consistency, um, his view is indeed a very exacting one based upon application of the intellect. And it is so exacting that uh, historically it was regarded as one that was simply unsustainable by most authorities. The alternative view, pertaining specifically to Trinitarian belief, focuses, I would say, especially on Exodus chapter 22, verse 19. At least in my Bible it's verse 19, it may be verse 20 in yours. That forbids engaging in serving any Elohim, any divine source, other than God alone, employing the Tetragrammaton. And this verse, independently of the discussion of Christianity, is understood in our tradition as the basis for forbidding conjoining God's name with anything else. What in the parlance of discourse in Jewish law is called in Hebrew shituf, which literally means conjoining. That is the conjoining of God's name with anything else. I fully appreciate that Christians do not regard Trinitarian belief as in any way a, um, a running contrary to the precepts of monotheism, but um, from the perspective of Judaism, Trinitarian belief is tantamount to a violation of this imperative. However, inevitably, with respect to the scope of this imperative, we return again to the question of what is binding as part of the heteronymous system upon Israel, and what is binding as part of the autonomous system with respect to all of humanity. And I do emphatically conclude from the sources that the majority position among our authorities is that that prohibition is a prohibition that is heteronymous and not autonomous. It is a prohibition that pertains to Israel and does not pertain to the nations of the world. Which then would mean that, if you ask me, is it permissible for a Jew to embrace Trinitarian belief? Categorically, no. But is it forbidden for a Gentile to embrace Trinitarian belief? It is not forbidden for a Gentile. It is forbidden exclusively to Israel. Which leaves, leaves me with no difficulty in affirming that a Christian believer is indeed upholding the entire Noahide covenant. Because the prohibition of Avodah Zarah is a prohibition that a Christian is fulfilling even as he or she embraces Trinitarian belief, although a Jew would, in, would indeed be violating the prohibition of Avodah Zarah were a Jew to entertain the same belief. Is it a contradiction? No, these are two different systems. There are two different right ways. And it raises even more questions, also <laughs> historically, because the first two, two generations of Christians were, of course, um, Jews. And um, so they were in Jerusalem. They were um, Jews. They kind of had a, a moral system like the Pharisees, um, uh, the later rabbinic uh, um, system. And the f uh, theolo the theologically said, the first Christology was the highest Christology. So, um, from um, from the sources, um, you might you might say that um, the first Christians who were Jews worshipped Jesus as God. My response is. First of all, I, I don't know that. That is, I, I don't know exactly what they believed, and I certainly don't have direct access to them because I don't know if any one of them any, are, is still alive. Um, but, um, it, and, and seriously, that is, is, and as much as we recognize that there was clearly an evolution of church doctrine over the course of the first centuries, what exactly they were believing, I think, will remain ultimately an unanswered question. But, but ultimately, what I will further affirm, and this from my perspective is the more critical bottom line, is we could indeed end up at loggerheads with respect to a historical analysis. That doesn't prevent me from being able to deal with the elephant, because I'm dealing with the elephant right now. A and just as you raised questions that pertain to the past, and I said it's time for us to turn a new page, here as well, we may indeed have issues that pertain to the past that will remain unresolvable. That doesn't yeah, prevent us from standing when, together today. When you, when you talk about the right here and right now, then the problem is, of course, that um, 
this might resolve the question for you, but um, Christians have the um, claim that they worship not just a deity, but the God of um, Abraham, Isaac, uh, and Jacob. So, um, from the Christian side of the, the room, <laughs> uh, they kind of um, um, witness or claim that they uh, also worship the God of Israel. And I was I had a question before, and maybe you have a vision about it. Um, in Acts 15, there is of course the little sentence, um, the law of Moses is um, read it everywhere, in every synagogue, in every city. How does how do you in interpret that sentence, or Jacob from Emden, maybe? Um, how, because, you know, this might also offer something more, you know? Like, um, maybe the, um, the, the visions from the prophets that, you know, the Goyim, they would come together with the Jews to Zion to, you know, to celebrate, uh, you know, you know. All Indeed. So you're raising two issues here. Yeah. One is the Christians maintain they are worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. Well, personally, if you ask me, I maintain the Christians are worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you ask me if, from my perspective, it is what I would deem to be the perfect way of serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, you can imagine what the answer is, which, of course, obviates the need for me to actually state it. <laughs> It's, it's but that's irrelevant. No, I, I, it, it's irrelevant because, again, my concern, first and foremost, is, pardon me, but the elephant. So far as I'm concerned, once I am able to come into the room and justify to myself that that is a foundation upon which we can agree, even that element, of worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is something that is, please don't take this the wrong way, a frill, a very valuable frill, a very meaningful frill, a very sacred frill. But it's not the foundation. The foundation is this. The foundation is what enables me to say we're on the same page and I have no inclination to try to change you into anything else because I believe you attain salvation in through what you're doing. Now, as for the verse that you mentioned, from Acts chapter 15. Of course, on the one hand, I will stress, and this is not merely a formal disclaimer, that um, this is a, a question for deliberation among Christian theologians, of which I am not one. But, um, but if you ask me on my own personal opinion... It was a Jewish council in Jerusalem, so maybe you can <laughs> relate to that. <laughs> if you ask my own personal opinion, I'll understand that precisely along the lines of heteronymous versus autonomous systems. That is, the Jews are going to come into the synagogues in all the cities throughout the world to hear, not law of Moses, the teaching of Moses, the Torah. I quoted from the Greek. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's Greek to me. But, uh, <laughs> the Torah of Moses. And they are indeed going to hear that message. It's an, it is, after all, a heteronymous system that you need to hear. And they will heed it and obey it because that's what God is requiring of them. And we're not going to require that of the Gentile world because for the Gentile world, this is what God is requiring. And these are two separate systems. And the attitude that we need to hold the Gentile world accountable to that system of the Torah and all of its commandments is simply groundless. If, if I um, may share, or maybe ask you to share, what you said to me with respect to that group in the early days of the church that was agitating the Gentile Christians needed to keep... Yes, I did my PhD work on early Christian texts, and it came to me that uh, it was one of the uh, results of my research that uh, most uh, uh, most fanatic group within the church uh, urging and um, especially uh, uh, converts to live like Jews most fanatic groups were um, Gentile Christians who turned to Jewishness mm. not the Jewish Christians themselves I remember you, you, all, you also um, shared with me, I, I don't know if this was um, a, a conjecture or something even more definitive, that 
um, the animosity toward the, these fanatical groups was later misdirected against the Jews who were never trying to agitate that Gentile Christians had to keep right. the, the uh, commandments. Yeah, can I, can I add one, one more thing? Because I'm, I'm really uh, um, interested in, you know, maybe not, not to call it a, a program, but, you know, a way to keep, you know, having conversations about this. Mm -hmm. But um, I think one of the major problems mm -hmm. still is that um, this is actually, it's only the difference between um, Israel and Goyim, of course, because Israel received the Torah, and the Goyim, um, the law, laws of Mo uh, the commandments of Noah. Um, but the Christian claim is that that um, somehow maybe um, Christians are not just Goyim, but they are following the Messiah of Israel. Um, so there, there is a, a Society of Scriptural Reasoning. Have you heard about it? It's from Peter Ox and um, Stanley Hauwas. And they, they read um, the, the, the Holy Text together, and they, um, they try to get clear what they disagree about, <laughs> you know? Okay. So um, they don't have to uh, convince the other to, to watch their side, mm -hmm. but they try to get clear what... Um, um, what the other is believing about themselves, but also about you know the other, because that's always involved, at least between Christians and Jews. Um, so I'm looking forward for to to further conversations and further meetings and maybe further conversations about it. But I'm still you know. Is there a way that, you know, Christians, um, so, wh yeah, wh so what's, what's the, is there a special place for Christians in, in this, in this vision or, you know, maybe they, they are, maybe they are just, you know, like Goyim who take up the uh, no guide laws and rejoice in it and have a vital spiritual life or is there something more, because you, you, you might have the same stories about, you know, Muslims or Buddhists or whatever. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so let me, yeah. let me um, <coughs> respond in a couple of planes. That is, yeah. first of all, as of course, I, I think you appreciate what you are addressing is that caveat that I stated at the outset that I'm speaking from a Jewish perspective. And um, again, of course, it should have been obvious that everything I've been saying is from a Jewish perspective. Mm -hmm. But I did want to highlight that line because, of course, I radically appreciate that Christians see their salvation in different terms than the terms that I used. The, uh, the formulation of Noahide laws as the basis of salvation is one that is very foreign to Christians. But then I'm not explaining to you why you believe you attain salvation. I'm explaining why I believe you attain salvation. Mm -hmm. Now, a as for the relationship specifically between Jews and Christians. I am going to indeed again affirm that I do believe that Christians are revering the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And moreover, what to me is the more critical basis of the relationship between us is that we revere God's will as revealed through his word in the Bible. Now, I, uh, I remember I once made this comment holding my Bible aloft to a uh, large group of young people that was coming to Israel with um, Hank Benedike and um, he uh, piped in, uh, yes Chaim, but our Bible is bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're dear, he's a dear friend and um, I, uh, I commented, um, uh, yes, well first of all of course if you really want me to talk about everything that we Jews revere we could take out the entire Talmud and uh, talk about a lot more than just the uh, the, the, ex the extra <laughs> sections that Christians revere, but more fundamentally, this is still something upon which we stand together. And that does represent, I think, a critically important foundation upon which to, to stand together. That is, we could, of course, merely speak in what to me would be relatively amorphous terms of we revere God together. I say amorphous because, again, we, we find ourselves once again in the quandary of what do we mean by God? When we say we believe in the God of the Bible together, that is a far more concrete, emphatic, definitive, and significant statement. And that's what we share, and that's the basis of our standing together. But if I may interpret Daniel's question in the other way around, um, 
maybe this is the final question then. Uh, is, it, is it for you uh, an advantage or a necessity that for us as Christians, Jesus is the bridge to the Noahic covenant? Is it for you a necessity or uh, a coincidence or an option? So, from my perspective, it is not a necessity, although I respect that for Christians it is. From my perspective, I will certainly concede that I recognize that revering Jesus is something that historically played and continues to play a critical role for Christians in coming to God and coming to His Word. Obviously, I can't share in that statement because Jesus is not part of my tradition, my relationship with God through God's Word and God's system as He gave it to Israel. But, uh, but that doesn't prevent us standing together. That really is one of many domains upon which we need to agree to disagree agreeably. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Chaim. Thank you so much for your lecture. It was full of insight. It was warming us uh, also up as Christians uh, to enter the same room. And so I come uh, hesitantly, rather, with a small token of our gratitude. It's about an elephant. <laughs> It's a description of the Baptist elephant in Europe, uh, Communities of Conviction, written by Ian Randall, one of our professors. And it gives a rather def a good definition of uh, this elephant in the room here, uh -huh. um, about the trunk and the legs and the body and the skin, etc. It says, on the occasion of your lecture at the Baptist House on June the 2nd, 2015, Hank and Turn and... Uh, we hope and pray that uh, you will continue your ministry and be blessed by Amen. the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. Amen. Thank you. This ends our session. And please uh, stay around if you want to have a conversation with Hein. Can we also uh, we oh, have yeah. a... We, ha we have... Um, uh, a, a, a series, an on, ongoing series. Oh, okay. We have an ongoing series of Bible study sessions uh, every Tuesday evening in English alone and Monday evenings with streaming Dutch translation. Um, and uh, registration is free, and you're certainly more than welcome. And, and I'll add, add further that while this seminar has been ongoing, uh, I, I would be, I'm very excited with the prospect, if it is feasible, to establish. A periodic meeting doesn't have to be frequent, be at whatever frequency people are interested, of pastors, theologians, theology students, that we can come together and have these sessions on an ongoing basis using the best video conferencing technology there is, which isn't that great nowadays, but it's getting better. Um, we, we, uh, we can really experience together that from Zion comes forth the Torah. So uh, if you can. Uh,